Hello, and welcome to our live webcast, The Concept of Early Implant Placement in Simultaneous Contour Augmentation, Indication, Surgical Technique, and Long-Term Results. We thank you for joining us. My name is Don, and I'll be the moderator for today's presentation. Before we get things started, I'd like to take a moment or two to acquaint you with a few features of this web event technology. At any time, you may adjust your audio using any computer volume settings that you may have. On the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see the Q&A window. There's a large window which holds all of your sent messages and a smaller text box at the bottom where you will type in your questions. To send us a question, please click in the text box and type your text. When finished, click the Send button. To receive your CE credit, you will need to complete the assessment quiz. To print your letter of verification directly from the webinar site, you'll be prompted to complete the quiz following the conclusion of this webinar. For those of you participating in a group, if you'd like to obtain a CE credit, the person who registered for the webinar will receive an email following this event with instructions. They can forward that email to the group. If you have any questions regarding group registrations, please contact us at webinars at osseo.org. If you require technical support at any time during the presentation, please contact us toll-free, 888-705-6002. International attendees can also call at 858 858- Two zero one forty one thirty six. Our presenter today, Dr. Daniel Boozer, is professor and chairman of the Department of Oral Surgery at the University of Bern in Switzerland. He spent three times sabbaticals at Harvard University in Boston, at Baylor College of Dentistry in Dallas, and the University of Melbourne. He received several scientific awards by professional organizations such as the ITI, the AO, the AAP, and the AAOMS. In 2011, he received an honorary professorship by the University of Buenos Aries. His main research areas are in tissue regeneration around dental implants, surface technology, and guided bone regeneration. He's authored and co-authored more than 280 publications and several textbooks, including a GBR book and two ITI treatment guides. He widely lectures at national and international conferences. So with no further ado, I will turn the presentation over to Dr. Booser. Hi, Don. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Danny Booser calling from uh, Switzerland. I um, apologize for the delay we had. The firewall of the Universal Burn gave us big problems. So I'm actually running on a hotspot of my cell phone. Uh, so iPhone, I hope it's going to work and we get through. Uh, I give you greetings from uh, my hometown, uh, Bern, Switzerland, the capital of Switzerland and the School of Dental Medicine. University of Bern, where I'm working since I graduated many, many, many years ago in 1980. Uh, you see, we are very active in the field of continuing education, and uh, we share our knowledge. This is a tradition here because we want to help improve the quality of uh, implant applications in daily practice. My most important collaborator or friend is Professor Belzer. Uh, where we do a lot of master courses in the field of implant dentistry. Okay, when we talk about implant dentistry today, we are in the phase of routine application. Uh, in our department, we treat more than 500 patients a year, most of them partially edentulous. Uh, single tooth replacement is the number one indication of implant therapy. Many of the patients belong to the baby boomer generation, and you see that the average age of our patient is more than 60 years. When we provide implant therapy, my goal is always for successful long-term outcome, and I try to go for 30 plus years. I have seen dozens of patients now I treated myself in the mid 80s with a 30 year follow-up, and that shows that this is absolutely possible. The topic today now is a very, very important topic. We talk about post-extraction implant placement of a single tooth in the aesthetic zone. We will discuss tissue biology, which is relevant for decision-making. As a clinician, I will show you briefly three different treatment options, immediate placement, early placement, or late implant placement. 
For the meter plate, I'll show you one case, which is only used in very ideal anatomical situations. The main surgical technique used here in Bern is early implant placement, which will be the topic of this presentation. I will present not only the surgical procedures, but also the, the long-term data on this approach. I give you a short introduction, then an update on tissue biology, then these treatment options, and then in detail early implant placement with some conclusions. Okay, when we talk about implant placement post-extraction, uh, this is a very frequent indication for implant therapy. It's about 70% of all implants we place. In the aesthetic zone, it's always very challenging, either advanced or complex. And as we have learned in the past 15 years, the timing of the treatment is very crucial. The question is when to place an implant and when to restore the implant. When we treat patients and what are patients asking for, in my experience of more than 30 years, the primary objective of implant therapy is actually what patients ask for. They want to have successful outcomes from an aesthetic and functional point of view, should be long-term stable, and they have, want to have a low risk of complications. These are the primary objectives. But in the last 15 years, we have made a lot of progress with the so-called secondary objectives. That means we want to achieve that goal with the least number of surgical interventions to have least possible pain and morbidity. We want to have short healing periods. And of course, we also want to have a good cost effectiveness. This is the overall strategy in all my way of thinking. And I hope that I can pass over this uh, strategy to those who are attending today. When we look at the factors that influence the treatment outcomes, then we have four circles. This was published in ITI Treatment Guide number three in 2008, together with Dr. Stephen Chen from Melbourne. It's the clinician, but it's the patient with all the risk factors. It's the different treatment approaches. And of course, it's the quality of the biomaterials utilized. So the clinician, based on the education of the clinician, the skills, and talent and experience. It's very important. So it's the number one factor for long-term success. Or you could also say, you see, because the surgeon is most important, he or she will examine the patient to establish a risk profile. He or she recommend a treatment plan. He or she selects the necessary biomaterials. And he or she performs the surgery. In other words, the surgeon is the biggest risk factor for the patient because if the wrong clinician is performing a procedure, the patient is at risk to end up with a non-successful treatment outcome. The recipe in all the years we have done, done implants in the aesthetic zone, the recipe from a surgical point of view has five bullet points. You need to understand the tissue biology, perform an aesthetic risk assessment. That's very absolutely mandatory. You have to put the implant in a correct 3D position. Most often we need to do some facial contour augmentation to reestablish a buccal bone wall. And when we do early placement, we go for primary wound closure to protect applied biomaterials. I will not go into all these details, but I think it's very important to mention these five bullet points when we talk about surgical recipe for success. The goal is from a surgical point of view to put that implant in a correct position. We call that restoration-driven restoration, restoration -driven implant placement. Uh, at the end of treatment, the implant should be fully surrounded, completely embedded in healthy bone, because the facial and oral bone wall should be at least one millimeter in thickness. Uh, in case of a local bone deficiency, GBR is necessary to reestablish mainly the facial aspect of the bone volume. And last but not least, the implant must be surrounded by healthy keratinized mucosa. That's not a big issue in the aesthetic zone because normally there is an abundance of keratinization available. The second point, I think that's in my experience the most important one because a lack of bone of the facial asthma is quite often seen. And when we see failed implants, it's most often associated with a lack of bone on the facial asthma. 
Okay, with that, I want to give you a quick update on tissue biology in post-extraction sites. It's important that you understand the tissue biology. One is the biologic width that was established in the mid-90s, early 2000s by three papers. And we have learned that the pink aesthetics is important to have uh, intact papillae. Then the mid-facial mucosal margin at the correct position and a nice convexity at uh, the uh, implant site. When we look into the numbers, and this is the paper by Joseph Kahn published in 2003, we know that in the mid-facial, uh, the thickness, vertical thickness of soft tissue is between three to four millimeters, whereas in the proximal sites, you have a little bit more thickness when the adjacent structure is a natural tooth. Then it's five to six millimeters. That means the papillas are often stretching into that space. And that has to do with the with the uh, connective tissue fibers attached into the cementum layer of natural teeth. That also means when we see deficiencies in the tissues like here or like here, it's always a lack of bone volume. It's not a lack of soft tissue thickness. So when we see these kind of defects, the, the, the question must be, is there a chance to augment the bone to get back then uh, to eliminate the tissue deficiency from an aesthetic point of view. The second point is the hard and soft tissue alterations following extractions. That's a, a hot topic 10 years ago, 15 years ago. We have learned a lot, in particular by the papers by Araujo, uh, 2005 and 2006. So when we pull a tooth, it's important to understand that we can get alterations in particular in the mid-facial aspect of the extraction socket. And here, when you see that site open, you can see that there, are, there is resorption on the facial aspect. This is bundle bone resorption that takes place following a tooth extraction. And uh, the study that really evaluated that in the aesthetic zone is the paper by Vivian Chappie from our group. Uh, excellent paper in Journal of Dental Research, highly cited now, because it showed that there is a difference between a thin wall phenotype and a thick wall phenotype. A thin wall phenotype shown here, you see here the red color, a major loss of vertical bone loss resorption, and whereas the thin, thick wall phenotype uh, show hardly any bone loss in a vertical direction. The study has shown there is a, a threshold value of about one millimeter when you are below, it's a thin wall phenotype, and you get much more vertical bone loss whereas when it's a thick wall phenotype, uh, then the resorption is minimal. And you can see here that the thin wall phenotype had a median vertical bone loss in an eight-week healing period of 7.5 millimeter, whereas the thick wall phenotype was only 1.1 millimeter. But it shows there was one millimeter bone resorption. Anyhow, there's no zero. That's very important to understand. When we look, how often is it thin? Then actually a paper by our group published in 2011 by Vedrana Braud, an ITI scholar from Croatia, that in the anterior maxilla, that the predominant phenotype is the thin phenotype, thin wall phenotype, because you can see that in central incisors, a 95 plus percent is either a lack of bone or a thin wall. So only in the first premolar site, the thick wall phenotype is increasing, as you can see here, because this is almost 30%. This was also confirmed in other studies uh, in, uh, in Brazil, you see Januario, or in the United States, that's uh, Chapel Hill, the Lyndon Cooper Group, and also in Hong Kong, when Professor Lang was in Hong Kong. These studies all show that the thin wall phenotype dominates the anterior maxilla. So we're going to see a lot of bone resorption post-extraction, which is a reality. The last uh, aspect of bone biology is the biology of the bone defect. And here we learned a lot from Bob Schenk in publication in 1994. And you see, we have learned that a two-wall defect uh, has a very favorable a defect anatomy and with a high osteogenic potential, whereas a one-wall defect is much lower 
and has a much more risk uh, for successful outcome. Because when you put an implant in, then of course a defect like this is very easy. I'm sorry, I clicked too quickly. It's very easy to do, uh, to regenerate successfully, because this situation here is much more demanding for the biology to regenerate by osteoplastic activity. So that means when you see a defect morphology, this is an early placement case. You see huge vertical dimension of the bone resorption. Then this implant is placed like this. And it's important to understand that the coronal apical dimension of the defect is not relevant at all. Relevant is the mesodistal width of the defect here. How wide is the defect? And here the classification of Joseph Kahn from 2007 is quite helpful because he made a differentiation V-shape, U-shape, W-shape. Another point very important is the width of the crest approximal to that implant site, mesally and distally. When you have more than six millimeters of bone available there, then you're gonna get a two-wall defect on the facial aspect. It's very important to understand. So when a put implant is put in, you see then we differentiate the, the, the defect width and the defect depth. Hmm? So the width, as I said, V-shape, U-shape, W-shape, and deep defect more than a millimeter, shallow defect less than a millimeter. So the best situation for successful regeneration would be a V-shape defect, which is deep. When we have an extraction, then timing is crucial, as shown in this uh, uh, treatment guide of RTI, it was number three in 2008. When you pull a tooth, you have the optimal volume of bone available, but you're gonna get some resorption. When you do an early placement at eight weeks, you still have an optimal volume available, but bundle bone has been resolved. If you wait longer, then you start to see then a modeling of the bone, and then all of a sudden the width of the crest is diminished, and this should be avoided because that is, uh, is compromising the treatment. And of course, it's also not very attractive to patients because patients would have to wait months uh, for this surgery. So I, I always said uh, either the immediate or the early placement uh, approach is the treatment of choice from the patient's viewpoint. When you look at the different uh, uh, bone uh, anatomies or bone defect anatomies, then we differentiate between horizontal bone augmentation and vertical bone augmentation. That's a huge difference. Today, we don't talk about vertical bone augmentation where uh, Istvan Urban is our uh, champion, uh, global champion today. This is always a one-wall defect. When we talk about horizontal bone augmentation, then we can have a three-wall defect, a two-wall defect, or a one-wall defect. That means when we are dealing with a post-extraction situation, we should do everything to keep the defect either three-wall or two-walls. Right? So don't let it heal over months to turn into a one-wall defect because that is compromising the situation for the patient and for you. With that one now, we move to the treatment options we have, the immediate versus early versus late. And you see, this is the nomenclature provided by ITI first in 2004 with the paper by Hammerley. And then Stephen Chen has done the subsequent uh, publications. And the ITI actually has been discussing this issue four times in a row every five years, most recently. Uh, two weeks ago at the ITI consensus conference in Amsterdam. Very interesting discussion. So we have three options in terms of the, uh, the, the terms. It's a need, needed placement, day zero. It's early placement with soft tissue healing or partial bone healing. And it's late implant placement, at least six months of healing or might be years of healing because it is not intentional. Important is that we, uh, we are um, looking for aesthetic outcomes. And in the 2008 ITI consensus conference, it was the first time that we looked at, to, at aesthetic outcomes. And we have seen that several papers reported not very favorable aesthetic outcomes due to the high frequency of mucosal recessions. These were the papers available at that time. It's important to mention that in all these studies, immediate implant placement was done without any inclusion criteria, so no case selection. And you see that the frequency of mucosa was quite substantial, significant. 
Some of them were 40%, even here 100% in a W-shaped defense in the paper by Joseph Kahn, published in 2007. So we learned, you see, that case selection is important. Another proof of that is the most recent paper by uh, Jan Kozin uh, from Belgium, who has uh, published a prospective uh, study on immediate, immediate approach with 17 patients. They included all cases with intact facial walls, but made no separate differentiation between thin wall and thick wall. And here you see that out of 17 patients was reported to have developed an advanced mucosal recession of more than one millimeter, three of them after the third year. So that study clearly shows that case selection is key uh, if you want to be successful. So that is the take home message I have. You see that you have to have inclusion criteria or selection criteria for this approach. So in a recent paper, we provided then the inclusion criteria for immediate placement, early placement, or late placement, and I will summarize that in the next five minutes. The paper I mentioned is a Journal of Periodontology paper, a review paper I've written with Stephen Chapuy, Urs Belzer, and Stephen Chen. It's a very nice summary with, the, with an update on all the relevant publications up to 2016. Uh, including, of course, also some case reports. When we talk now about immediate implant placement, that's at the same day, there are some groups of excellent experience, but not too much of long-term data published. Uh, and you see for immediate implant placement, these are now the, the clinical conditions that should be met uh, for this approach from provided by ITI in 2014, a facial bone wall, at least one millimeter in thickness, thick soft tissue biotype is recommended, no acute infection, and enough bone available, apical and palatal to the socket to provide good primary stability in a, in a correct position. The clinician should have a high level of clinical competence and experience because this is a complex procedure. That's not so easy. This is the, these are the publications by the uh, Dennis Tarnow and Stephen Chu group. I had the pleasure to be there uh, in uh, April 2016 together with my daughter Ramona to learn from the best for immediate, immediate approach. And it was a most uh, stimulating, stimulating experience, this visit in New York City. And coming back to Bern, you see we established a pilot case series to do this immediate, immediate approach, very strict case selection. That means only fully intact facial walls with a thickness of one millimeter and more. Uh, we did the immediate uh, implant placement approach flatless because that offers the best uh, attractiveness to patients, no morbidity. We are using all these computer-assisted implant surgery to maximize an optimal 3D position. And then we do an internal grafting of the gap uh, between the bone wall and the implant surface. The immediate restoration is always used when there is enough sufficient stability. The single crown is not used for chewing. It's mainly used for smiling. And, of course, the, the single crown is also a seal of the soft tissue defect in the crystal area. So there is no flap closure, of course, because there's no flap elevation. One case done uh, almost a year ago, you see here a thick facial wall. The detail shows that this is more than a millimeter in thickness, so that's an ideal case. Not so ideal was the sinus, so we could not stabilize the implant apical to the socket. We had to do through that uh, the mesial and the distal bone wall. Here you see then the whole planning. So we have taken a cone beam with a dicone file and a surface can to get an STL file. Then we use core diagnostics to do the planning. And we were planning to place a bone level implant of sufficient thickness as a wide body diameter. And then based on that one, uh, uh, Ramona produced for me a an, an surgical stent that was 3D printed. And that was then used for the surgery. Here you see the surgery. Tooth was removed very carefully without any flap elevation. We checked again the socket, which had very nice palatal and a buccal bone wall. And then we prepared the implant bed, took a periapical radiograph to check the depth of the whole thing, and finally we put the implant in. 
And here you see the white body bone level implant uh, from Stroman. You see very good primary stability. And then the chair side provision was fabricated. In the meantime, we did the internal grafting uh, with a low substitution filler. Uh, it was actually bone ceramic. And then the provisional crown was utilized uh, to seal off the soft tissue defect. Healing was very nice, patient, no complaints, excellent uh, buckle contour was maintained. You still see some remnants of the, of the fillers that have been utilized for this uh, dual zone augmentation, according to the Tarnow and Stephen Chu group. The periapical radiograph shows a very nice bone maintenance around the implant. And here you see at 10 months the final crown seated uh, by Ramona, and you see now uh, the result is very, very promising. So we have done so far 12 cases, uh, no complications. I'm very pleased, but I'm very, I'm very careful. Can you see? Uh, I want to see five-year data before we can uh, stretch the uh, envelope a little bit and go also to the thin mold phenotypes. With that, we go to the early placement protocol. That means whenever. We have a facial bone wall with, which is thin or actually not there, so lacking. Then we're going to use early implant placement whenever possible. We need a 3D cone beam CT uh, to really check it. We need a two wall defect, which is not a problem. And then uh, palato apical, we need enough bone volume to stabilize the implant in a correct position. Here you see two examples. You see one is a thin wall phenotype. You can hardly see any facial wall. And here is actually lack of bone because there was a perforation and the bone has been resolved by an infection. These are for me a clear indications for early placement because it's a very safe treatment and it's actually providing you excellent results, as I will show you. The paper of methodology was published in 2008. The first case, uh, case report was published in 2004 in an ITI treatment, in an ITI uh, consensus paper. You see the case we, we have presented in 2008, step-by-step -step procedure, clinical rationale. Here you see how the, tr the case was treated in 2005. See, Tooth was extracted, uh, flatless, of course, and then we had a crater-like defect, not, let's say, moderate in dimension, but very, very good in terms of V-shape and deep. So this is a very favorable defect. And you see then it was augmented with autogenous bone. It was augmented with a second layer. This is the DBBM, that's a bovine, deproteinized bovine bone mineral, then a non-cross-linked non collagen membrane and a primary closure. At that time, we have been using 12 weeks of healing and then the provisional restoration to go for an aesthetic treatment outcome. And here you see our patient 10 years later, and you see the periable radar shows excellent integration, not a single bone loss at these uh, platform switched implants. And the cone beam shows an excellent and fully intact facial wall. That means regeneration probably from here up has, has worked very nicely. And you see that the peak of the facial bone wall is about 1.5 millimeter uh, uh, crestally to the implant shoulder. The third aspect, uh, treatment option, the aesthetic zone is late implant placement. That's the least desirable because it's not very attractive to patients, but there are indications for this. You see, one is that you have extended bone lesions that will not allow primary stability using a type one, two or three approach. And that is the most frequent one. Uh, you have to use that in adolescent patients when patients are 15, 16 years after after dental trauma, losing their teeth, and then you have to wait until the patient is roughly 20 years of age. In these cases, a rich preservation technique is highly recommended, and so on. So you see here a case with a uh, cystic lesion that did not allow a primary stability uh, at uh, two months of healing or four months of healing. Uh, you see the tooth is slightly elongated. The, uh, the lesion is subacute. So I pulled the tooth and opened up the cyst to get rid of the, the pressure. And then six weeks later, as you can see here, 
then we have performed a cystectomy and, and actually like a retransplantation procedure in this defect area. There was no facial wall at all at that time. So we have used here again autogenous bone and DBBM. Up here, I used just collagen fleece for defect regeneration, then a membrane on top, and then a primary closure. Six months later, then we did a late placement. As you can see, here, everything was healed beautifully. And you see then here, uh, the implant was placed, the healing cap, and then a submerged healing. Uh, two months later, reopening, and then uh, provisional restoration. This was done by Dr. Wittenhaven, uh, a very talented female prosthodontist at our, at our dental school. And here you see then the patient at six years follow-up in 2016. You see very stable conditions. You see very nice convexity, the, gum, the mucosal margin correctly located, the implant perfectly integrated. And look, this, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot the, I lost here the, the comb beam picture. But uh, if you want to see that, that is a mistake now. I realize uh, I can provide that to you uh, by email. So now we go into early placement in detail. I want to show you the details with two cases. One is a female patient, age 73. The other one is actually an animation video of a lateral incisor. This uh, lady was uh, referred to me, age 73, had a... Uh, an ongoing loss of retention of this uh, canine crown, and the dentist then uh, asked me to remove the tooth and do an early implant placement. You see the, the cone beam shows no uh, presence of any bone wall uh, present. So here you see the extraction done very carefully. The goals of extraction are that you get an intact mucosa, you get keratinized mucosa about three to five millimeters wider, then you get all the bundle bone resolved during the healing period and you get a spontaneous soft tissue thickening. That gives you a thicker flap for surgery and if there is an infection with the fistula, then this infection, the fistula will be gone after eight weeks of healing. An intracellular incision. I hope this works now. The gingival margin is carefully mobilized with a fine periosteal elevator. The extraction is carefully done with a rotational movement. The socket is debrided to remove the granulation tissue. Then a collagen plug is applied for the stabilization of the coagulum. The socket is left to heal by secondary granulation. The removed tooth shows the area with the external resorption. So this is the extraction, you see. During the eight weeks of socket healing, Keratinized mucosa spontaneously forms over the socket. That's here. Yep. Initially, there is a slight invagination of the mucosa at the crest. Then a gradual flattening is observed on the mid-facial aspect of the yeah. extraction. Here socket. is the flattening because of bundle bone resorption. However, the rich contour does not change at the adjacent teeth that is within here. a four to eight week healing period. That's unchanged huh? because the teeth are still here. This frontal view shows the resorption of the thin facial wall triggered by bundle bone resorption. This causes a crater-like defect in the middle of the socket. The sagittal view shows the facial bone resorption and the ingrowth of soft tissues into the alveolus, leading to a spontaneous thickening of the soft tissues. This is biologically driven and is a clear clinical advantage for the future implant surgery. The coronal view shows the resorption of the facial bone wall and the spontaneous soft tissue thickening. Simultaneously, a flattening of the soft tissue contour takes place in the middle of the socket. That is here. Uh, you see, that's the flattening, what you normally feel when you palpate with your fingertip, but there is no change here and there is no change here. That means when you measure the width of the crest here with your comb beam at day of extraction or before extraction here and here, it will not change within four to six or eight weeks. And that's the big advantage of this approach. Eh? Okay, this has been published by Vivian Chapri as well in 2015, a paper that is most interesting. And you can see here that uh, you have a soft tissue thickening, uh, thickness at, uh, at extraction of one millimeter, and then in the middle of the socket, eight weeks later of five millimeters as a mean or the median value. The big advantage of this one is that you have a thicker flap for implant surgery, better vascularity, and actually to tell you the truth, 
We do not need to uh, uh, use any connective tissue grafting as a routine procedure in these kind of cases. So this eliminates a lot of morbidity to the patients and will also reduce expenses for the patients. So here you see our patient, 73 years of age. You see the incision now, and the incision is a triangular incision. We learned that from the from the Italian colleagues about 10 years ago, but also by Uli Grunder, because he has used this remote uh, releasing incision for many, many years. And here you see following elevation of the flap, you see this thick soft tissue flap in the area of the form of the future implant site. And here you see this. Post-extraction implant surgery is initiated with a circular incision at the adjacent central incisor and extended in the edentulous area in a slightly palatal position. The blade is inserted deep into the remaining socket along the inner palatal wall. The incision is continued through the sulcus of the adjacent lateral incisor, combined with a papilla base incision and a vertical releasing incision at the first premolar. The result is a triangular flap which offers excellent vascularity and eliminates the risk of a vertical scar within the aesthetic frame. The mucoperiosteal flap is now carefully elevated with a fine tissue elevator. In the extraction site, the soft tissue within the former extraction socket is mobilized as part of the focal flap. This provides a thick soft tissue biotype in the future implant site. The surgical site is exposed and irrigated with sterile saline. So here you see again these advantages of this uh, spontaneous soft tissue thickening. This is a huge advantage simplifying the procedure for implant surgery and giving the patient a very thick facial soft tissue on top of an increased um, bony wall. And then the implant is placed in a correct position. We are using the so-called comfort zones. The implant platform must be in the correct position that is here. And I will give you the details. Uh, this is a paper from an ITI consensus conference in 2003 published in ITOM in 2004. Highly cited paper now with, uh, with almost 300 citations. Uh, see, the comfort zones have been defined in mesodistal direction, corona apical direction, and orofacial direction. Most important that the implant is slightly palatally positioned uh, uh, from the point of emergence. Here you can see that this uh, position can be checked during surgery. The axis must be correct because we're always using screw-retained restorations. We don't want to use angled apartments because this is only a burden from a prosthetic point of view. And another one is that the implant shoulder should be at least a millimeter subcrestally on the palatal side and on the mesial and on the distal side. This is just to prevent an exposed micro rough implant surface then uh, after the remodeling and healing. And of course, we have a buckle defect, two wall defect in this case. We are adding a two millimeter healing cap on top of it, and now we are doing a bone augmentation procedure to the rim of the healing cap. So then at the end, when everything is healed, the implant shoulder on the bulk class will be again subcrestally. That, that's the strategy from a surgical point of view. The contour augmentation has been used first time in 1998. I will show you that patient later on. We are using since then a two-layer composite graft with two bone fillers in two layers, autogenous bone chips, and an hydroxyapatite-based bone filler, which is a bovine-derived bone filler with a low substitution rate. On top of that, we use a resolvable collagen membrane so we can eliminate the reopening procedure to uh, uh, remove the membrane, and then we go for primary wound closure. So we are not using any immediate restoration in this kind of application. Why do we use two bone fillers? The fillers support the collagen membrane, that's for sure, but the autograft, the autograft chips strongly accelerate new bone formation, whereas the DBBM, that's the bovine filler, increases the volume of the augmentation and provides better volume stability due to the low substitution rate. Here you see how this is done today. We are taking, when the flap is opened, we are taking the blood. 
We are mixing the blood with sterile uh, saline. See. And here you see then, uh, we take the autogenous bone in the local vicinity, same flat, can be at the nasal spine with a flat chisel, but we also use often this bone scraper, which has to be sharp. It's a hoof reading instrument. And then we put them into the, the, the blood bath, you could say, into the blood, because we know that the blood is going to provide, the blood will get a lot of growth factors. This is 15 minutes later. And then we are using these, uh, we call it BCM, bone condition medium. These growth factors will activate, uh, will activate then these DBBM particles for augmentation. Okay, so this is in the, I don't know why there is no sound here. Now, autogenous bone okay. chips are locally harvested within the same slab from the cortical bone surface. This can be done with a flat chisel at the nasal spine or with a sharp bone scraper from the bone surface towards the nasal fossa. The resulting bone chips are 1.5 to 2 millimeters in size and they are stored in the blood. As shown by several preclinical in vitro studies, these bone grafts release numerous proteins and growth factors into the blood and is termed bone conditioned medium. It's a very important concept, I can tell you, because it shows excellent results. But today we are doing this very systematically, very early on in surgery to have then this blood mixture about 50 minutes exposed the to the autogenous bone. The examination of the local anatomy by using first the periodontal probe. The crest width is then analyzed with a caliper. Okay, here you see again the power of BCM, bone condition medium, because these particulate autographs contain non-collagen proteins. These growth factors are released immediately into the blood and they will, of course, activate bone formation. They have an osteogenic potential, so excellent osteogenic properties. This has been tested and uh, studied in vitro studies, currently 13 papers published by the group at the University of Bern. You see, and uh, I show you the most recent one, which is in press now in the International Journal of Oral Science by Maria Asparuova. And you see that uh, it tested here uh, these uh, autogenous bone chips from a pig mandible and with, uh, with, uh, with uh, blood serum and blood serum and, and ring solution. And you see that in a short time period, BCM immediately releases very quickly the TGF beta 1, which is a proliferation factor. And then in a, in a, in, in a couple of hours, then uh, these bone chips release the BMB2 into the blood. And both, of course, are very potent growth factors for the acceleration of new bone formation. And this has been shown also in vivo studies by our group. Here you see two papers by Simon Jensen from Copenhagen, who was an ITI scholar in Bern in the early 2000s. And you see that uh, in these studies, uh, the also genetic potential is always the best for autogenous bone. It's no question. Nothing gets close to autogenous bone. Whereas the volume stability, the substitution rate, the DBBM showed the best data. That means for volume stability and volume maintenance, you need DBBM if you want to maximize this. And that has explained, of course, these fantastic histologic examples. This is a paper from myself in 98 with Bob Schenk, a four week a defect, eight millimeters in diameter, and you see that this was fully breached in four weeks. This is a paper by Jensen in 2006, it was a five millimeter defect, and here the, the defect was completely breached with woven bone with these autogenous bone chips within a two week healing period. Here you see the chips, and you see dark blue, the, the woven bone, immature woven bone, but you see everywhere these bone chips attract the osteoblasts to sit down and produce then the osteoid. Okay, the take home message is clear. If you want to maximize uh, bone augmentation, you need autogenous bone to accelerate bone formation. Plant bed preparation is initiated with a number two round burr preparing into the apical bone structure. This is followed by the first spiral drill of 2.2 millimeters diameter 
using a drill speed of 800 RPM. Bone preparation is done with copious cooling using chilled sterile saline. The depth gauge is inserted to check the sink depth and the implant axis. It's obvious that the axis must be carefully corrected to a slightly more inclined axis. This is done with a second spiral drill using a reduced drilling speed of 500 RPM. The preparation depth is chosen at 14 millimeters. The second depth gauge now confirms a correct implant axis. Final preparation is done with a profile drill, removing some bone at the inner surface of the palatal bone wall. The implant is inserted with a speed of 15 RPM without irrigation. The implant shoulder should always be located subcrestally in relation to the palatal wall. Depending on the local anatomy, a healing cap of two millimeters is inserted. The frontal view shows the correct positioning coronal apical direct. See how the implant is placed, and then of course the augmentation to the rim of the healing period is done first with autogenous bone chips, and then with DBBM, and then the membrane is the applied. The bone conditioned medium. The medium is used to moisten the bovine bone filler, which has a low substitution rate. The bone conditioned medium contains a lot of proteins and growth factors, which are absorbed by the bone filler particles. Bone augmentation is initiated with the application of the autologous bone chips. The first layer of bone chips is applied to the rim of the healing cap and completely fills the facial bone defect. The second layer of bovine bone particles is used to over contour the local ridge anatomy. The surgical technique is called contour augmentation using the two synergistic bone fillers of autologous bone chips and bovine bone particles. A critical step for a GBR procedure is the utilization of a barrier membrane. A collagen membrane is cut into two pieces, a larger and a smaller one, and trimmed to shape. Collagen membranes offer several advantages for the clinician. One is that they are easy to apply when soaked with blood. When moistened with bone condition medium, the membrane becomes soft and adhesive. It can be easily adapted to the local bone anatomy. The second membrane strip improves the membrane thickness in the defect area and improves the stability of the membrane. The sagittal and coronal views show the various steps of contour augmentation. The bone chips fill the bone defect and will stimulate new bone formation. The bovine bone particles provide the contour augmentation and long-term stability, since they have a low substitution rate. The collagen membrane provides a barrier function to avoid the ingrowth of soft tissue cells. Oh, that we see here now the case where the membrane has been applied. And then, of course, the uh, surgery is completed with a tension free primary wound closure using interrupted single sutures with 5 0 non resorbable monofilament suture material. It's very important to have a tension free primary closure, as you see it here. And then, of course, you can apply the provisional restoration, but it has to be shortened so there is no direct contact to the defect site. The defect site or the, the surgical site should be without any pressure during initial wound healing. Eight weeks of healing is the reopening uh, because then we go into an early loading or early conventional loading because it takes normally a week or so to produce then the provisional crown. And here you see the patient that has been reopened at eight weeks and then in private office the crown has been fabricated. And here you see the lady at two years follow up, very healthy interface. Uh, the soft tissue is very uh, without any signs of infection and inflammation. I show you now uh, two or three cases and we come to the results. This is a case where we have had no buccal bone wall at all due to a long-standing infection. And then it was pulled. Uh, eight weeks later, the surgery was done with a huge W-shaped type defect, very deep, which is very favorable. A uh, lot of bone has been used to fill up that whole defect, TBBM and membrane. 
and then primary closure. Here you see at three years a very nice treatment outcome for the implant, but also an, a resorption of the lateral incisor here. So that gave us a chance to take another cone beam. And here you see the cone beam of the case at three years. Also excellent uh, uh, outcome. And here you see the patient at seven years. And you see excellent home care of this young lady. And you see the implant is doing fantastic. And the aesthetic outcome is superb. Another case where we have done in 2005, before bone level implants were used, you see here, same technique, we shape deep, so that's a favorable one. And you see here the whole procedure again, same type. And then you see here at 2006, and now here 12 years down the road, a little bit of uh, mucosal recession because patient continued to grow. And then uh, the incisal step was about half a millimeter and it was then corrected by reduction of the incisal edge by the private dentist. But you see the result is very uh, satisfactory. And then you see the radiograph, you see 12 years down the road and look here, the cone beam that shows a fantastic facial bone wall. And last but not least, the first case we treated with this technique in 1998. Now, at the, here you see how it was documented at that time. So, first case in the aesthetic zone. And here you see at five years. And here you see the patient at 20 years, a few months ago. I think it was uh, late January this year. And you see here the excellent periapical radiograph. And look here, the excellent cone beam that shows the whole facial bone wall is fully intact. The thickness is roughly two millimeters. With that, we come to the documentation of long-term data. We have a couple of publications based on two patient cohorts. I only show you the last published data just two months ago by Vivian Chapri. By the way, Vivian Chapri yeah, uh, on Saturday has received the Andre Shirt Research Award uh, by the ITI, a very prestigious award for this 10-year study, which is a unique study because it shows with, without, a, without a dropout uh, the results of 20 patients documented over 10 years. Early plane contour augmentation, just one example. You see that the implant is doing fantastic. This patient was 38, and also this patient showed a little growth, a little recession at the natural tooth, but nothing at the implant. You see a huge difference at the time of surgery. This is 10 years down the road radiographically, and this is the cone beam that shows excellent facial bone wall. The whole defect is nicely regenerated. You see, we have not seen any, uh, any recession except in Mrs. M here. About a millimeter, this lady showed no facial bone wall. That's a failed procedure. That's a 5% failure of counter augmentation, 95 times successful. Here you see all home beams of these 20 patients. This is Mrs. M. That shows no bone wall. All the others have a bone wall. And here you see uh, the 70% with a facial wall extending coronally to the implant shoulder, 25% and a facial bone wall with a little bit of resorption here. And Mrs. M, which is a failed procedure uh, for reasons I don't know. Here, is, here are the data from a radiographic point of view. I don't want to go into details, but you can see that uh, you see the facial bone wall thickness on mean value is 1.7 millimeter at six years and 1.7 millimeter at 10 years. So actually very stable situation, except in Mrs. M. With that, I come to the conclusions. You see, I wanted to tell you that implant therapy in the aesthetic zone is challenging. You should stick to evidence-based procedures. Uh, most of the cases are post-extraction cases in the aesthetic zone. And in these situations, you need to understand involved tissue biology. Second, reach alterations following extraction is much better understood. You cannot stop bundle bone resorption because it's a biologic phenomenon. There's no way to stop that. In most cases, you have to compensate for this resorption uh, by local contour augmentation because that bone structure is important for the soft tissue support on the aesthetic outcome. Today, you have as a clinician uh, uh, three treatment options in post-extraction sites. Timing is important. The clinician should choose a treatment approach which offers high predictability and low risk of complications. 
And the treatment of choice depends on the anatomic risk factors, but also the skills and the talent of the clinician. If you cannot do immediate implants on a routine basis, I would recommend don't do it because you need to have a lot of experience to be successful. See, immediate placement, the ideal case is beautiful technique. It's not long-term documented yet, uh, but this will come, I'm sure. It should only be used in well-selected cases. Ideal case with a thick wall phenotype. It should be done flapless, and I do it computer-assisted to optimize the implant position and the implant axis in particular. When this is not the case, ideal cases, then we go for early placement because it's a treatment of choice then. It's about 80 plus percent. Contour augmentation is routinely performed with a two-layer composite graft. And we use a membrane to cover the augmentation material. We use primary wound closure and a rather short team of eight weeks, which is an early loading protocol. The treatment options you have have been displayed, you see. You know today the inclusion criteria, depending on your skills and your experience and so on. Of course, you have certain preferences. I would say most often we use early placement, uh, let's say more than 80%. A late placement in the aestheticone very rarely because it's the least attractive to patients. And we are increasing our frequency of immediate implant placement with immediate restoration. How we learned it by Dennis Tarnow and Stephen Chu, and I thank them very much for this insight. And I think this is going to increase. It's now less than 5% in the moment. It will increase further. With that, I would like to thank you. If you are interested in our continuing education program, you can find it on the internet. You see, we are offering master courses for, let's say, advanced clinicians. Uh, one of them is uh, upcoming soon. This is the GPR, the Science for Elevation Procedures. But we also have one on, uh, on aesthetic implant dentistry with her Spelzer. The master course is very popular because we have since two years now also Dr. Istvan Urban as a guest speaker. We have been sold out last time and we're going to be sold out again probably in June 20 to 22nd. Uh, if you should have uh, a desire to come to Bern, we would welcome you, of course, with pleasure. I thank all of you for your attendance. I uh, send you this most beautiful picture from Bern, Switzerland, with these stunning Alps in the background. And I hope I could provide to you an interesting lecture. Now let's see if our uh, Q&A works. I have no clue. All right, excellent. I'll remind our audience that the Q&A window can be found on the right-hand side of your screen to submit a question. Please type it in the small text box at the bottom, and when finished, click the Send button. Please note that due to time constraints, our speaker may not respond to all the questions submitted. If your question is not answered, please send it to webinars at osseo.org. That's webinars at osseo.org. And Dr. Boozer, we've got three questions in the queue. First question, if we place an implant immediately or early after extraction, is this intervention able to stop the bone resorption of the ridge? No, not at all. You see, you have to understand that this uh, bundle bone resorption is, is, a, is a biologic phenomenon because it's due to the blood supply, which is interrupted following extraction. The bundle bone dies because the, blood, uh, the bone has no blood supply anymore, and this is attracting uh, then osteoclasts, and they move in, and they will remove that. So when you do early placement, bundle bone has been completed already, bone, bundle bone resorption. In immediate implant placement, you're going to get the bundle bone resorption anyhow, but you do an internal grafting, and therefore it should not be a problem. It seems that I lost you now. Uh, actually, I've... Okay. Yep. okay. Good. Excellent. All right. And uh, our next question is forthcoming. The question is, what criteria do you – oops, had something pop up over my question here. I'm going to drag that yeah, out. Yeah, exactly. Right? What criteria does uh, Dr. Boozer apply for sectioning the labial frenum as depicted in the two cases? The frenulum. Okay. This is done with a CO2 laser because we are using CO2 laser in our stomatology or all medicine uh, service, and then uh, it's very simple and very easy procedure then to cut the frenulum if it's very prominent. And uh, the CO2 laser, of course, gives you an immediate 
uh, coagulation, so the, there is no bleeding afterwards. When you don't have a CO2 laser available, then of course you can do that uh, with a scissors or with a blade and then do a suture or so. So uh, I do it quite often at reopening procedure. All right, and next in the queue, in the extensively described case of number 13 replacement where a PFM crown was present on number 14, what kind yes. of lateral disclusion was applied? Oh, you ask me a prosthetic question. I have no clue. I would say uh, what I learned from uh, Professor Belzer, so our implant-supported single crowns have a just normal occlusion. Uh, because uh, we, uh, we are not afraid that this is going to have to be harmed by the occlusion in, 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 a, in a lateral occlusion or so. But uh, I, I cannot give you the details. I'm an, I'm an old surgeon and I'm working exclusively with a team approach. That means I have a lot of prosthodontists or GPs working with me and they take care of, this, uh, of the prosthetic treatment. So I cannot give you all the details about prosthetics. All right, very good, Dr. Boozer. That's all the questions we have in the queue at this time. Any closing thoughts from your end, sir, before we wrap things up? Yeah, it seems that it worked out really well. Uh, I think uh, for me it was very convenient to do a lecture uh, into the web space and sitting at my, at my desk at university and now go home and have a drink. I think it's quite a, it's a stunning procedure, very good technology. All right. Thank you, sir, for the excellent presentation and for your thoughtful response to the questions we received. And thank you to our audience. On behalf of the Academy of Osseo Integration, I'd like to thank you for your participation in today's event. Please note a post-event survey will appear requesting your feedback. Please take a moment to complete this survey as it will help the Academy plan future web events. This concludes today's program. Thank you and have a nice day. Okay, thank you very much as well.